his lecture series on Chimura variety. Okay, so thanks for the introduction, and thanks for still being here in the third day. We all still survived. Okay. All right, so uh, today, in fact, last time I ended by giving some preview of what I might be talking about today. So I think I mentioned several different kinds of complications, and uh, yesterday afternoon you already saw the application of things like Borel series complication, which are nice for the application of topology just because it keeps all these uh, cycles and circles, I mean, circles or something. But uh, today we're going to talk about the complications which have more chance of being useful for just, you know, the algebraic kind of things. So there are algebraic varieties or things which even might have integral models and might be useful for like those arithmetic applications other than just calculating the cohomology or, or automorphic limitations. So the picture will be the following. So uh, I still have, well, let me still just say that we, we are considering some kind of quotient of a Hermitian symmetry space or some unions of them by some arithmetic group acting on it. And then we have uh, several kinds of complications, but now we are going to focus on basically uh, firstly into this, uh, what I denoted minimal, which is the, the usual Satake Bell Borel complication. And the reason I denote by minimal is because I prefer to just call it minimal complication. So my first task will be to give you some idea of what this is like. And the idea will be the following. So the idea will be that, just like in, in the modular curve case, uh, we have something like uh, the upper half plane quotient by some, some gamma, and then we try to compactify it by adding some cusps. So we will basically compactify it by it. There, we'll take this P1, Q, and put them together. And of course, I'm cheating because I didn't tell you which topology I'm using. But anyway, for some suitable topology, this compactifies the, the space. So with suitable topology. And in fact, this picture generalizes. So for, well, for this uh, minimal convocation, I will be telling you what kind of things you should put in addition to the, to the D you have. And once you have those things there, and once you attach them with the so-called Sataka topology, which I'm probably not going to explain at all, uh, you will find some nice compactification, which will turn out to be a projective variety. An important thing is that it's normal, which is, and also uh, it carries a lot of, at least those uh, scalar value weight, sorry, the scalar, uh, scalar value modular forms, I mean, a lot of them. So there's a reason that it has fun, fun, some fundamental importance. Okay, so let me try to give you some idea. Well, in some sense, I'm going to first reinterpret what we are doing there. So what is this P1Q in the modular curve case? So we have a, some kind of uh, relational structure of the group. So in fact, this is actually the orbit of infinity. So if I pick infinity, then I just let the rational elements of the group act, and then I get all the cusps. So uh, before I move on, let me just clarify that sometimes experts will just say, well, there's only one parabolic group, there's only two parabolic group. What it really means is that there are only one orbit, two orbits, because certainly starting with any one, you can conjugate and get infinitely many. So there's never a chance that you only have one. <laughs> Either you have zero or infinitely many. So, sometimes I might make this mistake too. Maybe if I say there's only one parabolic, I really just mean there's one orbit. Yeah, so if I make a mistake, just correct, well, well just correct it in your mind, I guess. <laughs> okay, so this is uh, the orbit that is always there. And the question might be how to think about this thing. So in projected coordinate, so if you remember, we can actually think of all the actions and all the points of this H inside P1 with this kind of Z over 1 coordinate. So in projected coordinate, this is basically just this, uh, well, it's not z over 1 for any z. It's actually more like 1 over 0, something like that. And there is certainly some kind of elements of the group preserving this. So elements of SO2Q preserving all the things like star 0 form of so-called parabolic subgroup in this case. Wow, 
Well, you can check that this is right just because if you multiply this to that on the left, then this bottom thing will multiply with that and still get zero. So this is actually the subgroup preserving this element. And in fact, this is, this is useful in general too. And uh, I guess it's not easy to explain why this is the case, but somehow all the things we really need to add are corresponding to those so-called uh, rational parabolic subgroups, not arbitrary ones. So, so what we need So in general, I mean, it's not necessarily just SO2 anymore. For general D, R, well, I will leave some space here. Are the rational parabolic subgroups of the group, I mean, so I leave some space here. What I would say is that we need the maximum Rational parabolic subgroups of them. Uh, yesterday we have this Borel theory compactification, and there you actually need all the parabolic subgroups. But for the Bailey Borel kind of construction, you only need the maximum ones. It's probably not obvious why this is so, but anyway, let's move on and see some examples, and hopefully we'll get some intuitive feeling. But it's probably not going to be approved anyway. So let me give, also give you some idea of what these kind of things really are like. And before I move on, uh, I think it's more fair if I at least mention a little bit what these kind of things really are. So parabolic subgroups are the subgroups. So if I have a P, a parabolic P, and means uh, G mod P is actually a projective variety. So although usually we just say, well, you have some kind of upper triangular matrices, this is a, the, the actual definition. So if you have G mod P being a projective variety, then this is actually the case. And in this particular case, if you have like SL2 mod out this kind of matrices, you actually get something which is like the, the projected, I mean, P1. So this is a particular case of a projective variety. In general, if you mod out this kind of things, you don't always get the projective space like Pn, but you can get something which is like a Grassmannian or flag variety, something like that. And those things are also known to be projective varieties. And in fact, in many examples where I'm going to explain today, because of the, the, re, uh, the way I wrote down the elements of the groups, uh, the, major, the, the matrix expressions of these kind of parabolic subgroups might not always be upper triangular, just because the way I chose the coordinates. So some of them actually will turn out to be a mixture of upper and lower triangular. But the point is that they will still correspond to some kind of flag variety or Grassmannian variety, so they are still parabolic subgroups. So parabolic doesn't really just mean Upper triangle, it has a more precise theoretic meaning, which is this. Also, you might wonder what, why the rationality really matters. I guess uh, I cannot really explain it, but I will give you the keyword. So if you remember, we have this picture in other lectures about this kind of fundamental domain. And all you need to add is just some kind of point there. Or if you don't want to draw the picture this way, you can still think about other costs here. The idea is that when you try to approach the, the kind, of, kind of this boundary kind of point, you can only approach those rational ones. You cannot really approach those other irrational ones. So this is the key word for this is the so-called reduction theory. I'm not going to say anything about it, but if you want to know more about why this is true, this is the reason behind this. This tells you only the rational so-called rational boundary components matter. So our priority can also consider all the real points on, I mean, on the real line, but those things just don't necessarily, don't really matter for this picture for the purpose of trying to compactify. And also because of that, you also have to really modify the topology so that, you know, the topology we're putting here is not really the induced topology from P1C. It's really different because any two points here, no matter how close they are, you really have to think of them as really just different. Okay, so this is a kind of digression, but let us see some examples, I guess. Okay. So I will probably think of that as example zero, and now we start with example one. So yesterday we have those things, well, in fact, not yesterday, on Monday, we have, for example, like SP2N, Maybe I will start with a more modest thing. That is possible with SP4, like this. And now I'm writing down this Q structure because, to be fair, all these things depend on the rational structure because we're talking about rational parabolics. 
So if you choose a different rational structure, then of course the whole picture of rational pair body should be different. Later I will give you some examples which indicate this difference. But now let us first finish this example. So this thing of course acts on this uh, zero upper half space of dimension two, well not dimension two, sorry, dimension three, but it's a two by two matrices, uh, symmetric matrices with positive definite imaginary part. So if you have something like this, now the question is what are the kind of parabolics here? And sometimes when we write down some good examples, we call them sort of standard parabolics. So uh, there are some kind of standard parabolics. And as I indicated in the beginning, all the other parabolics are basically orbits of, I mean, they're in the orbits of these things. So I'm going to write down some elements like here. And just to remind you, my, my definition of the SP 2N uh, respects the pairing defined by uh, this uh, 1, sorry, 0, 1, N minus 1 and n, uh, sorry, uh, 1 and 0. And uh, for th because the reason I write this thing is like, uh, this is like 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 here, and then one, negative 1, negative 1 here. So it's not really the, the kind of anti-diagonal thing that some other people might prefer. So my matrices will not really be upper triangular <laughs> for this reason. Anyway, let me show you some interesting parabolics. Uh, some of them will not be maximum. So in fact, there is always an interesting thing to start with. There's a Borel subgroup which is one of the most important parabolic. And in this case, you are going to see that it's actually not upper triangular. So I will just draw the elements. Well, in fact, the, the block here, because of the way we define the matrix, is related to the block here by some kind of transpose inverse. So in fact, I have to put things down here. It's really not upper triangular. And then we have other things. OK, so anything without a star is 0. So the, the elements of this form form a Borel subgroup. There's also another parabolic, which is of this form. This probably looks more comfortable because it looks a bit like upper triangular. <laughs> this is the kind of block upper triangular kind of thing, two by two blocks. I might give you the wrong impression that everything should have a name, but anyway, it's true that the last thing also has a name. This is the last time we have all these. In the future, we don't have all these names. Uh, what is this? Uh, this is, uh, I'm going to explain why these things should look like this. For now, it look, just looks like more, for no reason I know where they are. <laughs> so why do, why do we know this? So there is actually a general principle, which is not just true in the zero case. Well, to be fair, it's only for classical groups. I didn't mention this terminology yesterday, but these are all the groups which are not exceptional, uh, defined by pairings. Well, the various pairings we have, not just arbitrary pairings, but so, so far we have all kinds of like symplectic group, orthogonal group, and so on. These are defined by pairings. And these things defined by pairings are interesting just because these pairings are not, not just useful for defining the things. They actually tell you uh, some special things about the subspaces. So all these parabolic subgroups uh, sort of preserves some kind of flags or chains Well, I mean, I would say more precise. Each parabolic subgroup preserves some flag of isotropic subspaces. And if you want rational, you just put rational everywhere. Each rational parabolic preserves some flag of isotropic rational subspaces. So now we can try to see what kind of subspaces are preserved by each of these. So for example, this one preserves something like this. This is an isotropic subspace. Well, what does isotropic mean? It means that if you pair things inside the, the subspace with some other element from the same subspace, the pairing gives you zero. So if you get zero out of the pairing, it's called isotropic. If you do this using that pairing, then you do get zero because 
anytime it has to pair with something, these are zero. So it's OK. This one preserves this. Some people might not like the idea of only using the isotropic of spaces. They would like to also take the orthogonal complement and form a more complete flag. But it's, the essential point is this bottom part of the flag, which is the isotropic flags. Well, these are kind of fake flags. They are just one, one of space. This one is really a, a flag in the sense that you start with this and then go into this. Yeah, so uh, I think, yeah, so you can check that in this case, uh, you get all kinds of parabolics. And in general, you can also imagine how to do SP2n for any n, because now you just write down all the possible subspaces. Well, you need some kind of abstract algebra or maybe basic linear algebra to show that all the rational subspaces can be moved into something like this kind of standard coordinates. And this is one of the reasons I chose the pairing to be like that, just for convenience. But of course, if you have your other choice of the pairing, you might have your other set of nice choices of subspaces, then you have your other kind of ways of writing down your favorite standard parabolics. So they might not be exactly the same, but it depends on your choices. So if you look at those three, which are the maximal ones? All but one of them. <laughs> so the maximal ones are this and that. So these are the maximal ones. Are, uh, are in G. Well, I didn't say G. G is that thing. Sorry. That's before G conjugates of either of these. Yeah. So this is just a special case when you have something like that. And in general, if you have SP2n, you also can list all the maximum parabolics easily. And you can imagine that the more complete your flag is, the smaller your parabolic is, just because you have to preserve more structure. So all the maximum ones are those ones preserving exactly just one, one space. So they are really just preserving one particular space. And now you might ask, why are these parabolics really parabolics? That's because if you preserve just one space, then it's really some kind of Grassmannian. So Grassmannian varieties are projected, as we know. So if you come back to this definition, all these things preserving just that, course, that uh, kind of single space give you some kind of a sort of generalized Grassmannian for this kind of group. And that's how you get the parabolics. And for the Borel, you get something which is more complicated than Grassmannian, it's some kind of flag variety. And they're still projective. In case you have not heard of this, uh, this Borel thing is actually sort of the minimal thing. Everybody should, should contain some, some conjugate. And this is also quite important. So apart from talking about maximal parabolics, you also have this minimal kind of thing there. And in this uh, Borel set compactification, you really need all three kinds of them. But in the, uh, in the Betty Borel kind of setup, we only need the maximal ones. But just knowing the parabolics are not enough. We want to know what kind of boundary component it really determines. So let us start with another kind of game, which is apparently not obviously related to there. So we can also consider, well, let me first write down what the, the conclusion for SP2n is. So we have a maximal rational parabolics conjugate to something of this form. Uh, these are now blocked matrices. Maybe when you see really larger things, you start to see the pattern. But this doesn't look larger, right? This looks like that Klingon thing. Anyway, this is uh, ah, yeah, this is size r. So this actually determines that. So these two blocks are related to each other by transpose conjugate. Sorry, transpose inverse. And then you have these uh, four blocks. 
these four blocks actually give you, so these are size, well, each block, each size uh, uh, minus r. And in total, these four blocks actually form a smaller sympathetic group. And then there's this, uh, this thing above, in some sense, well, there's one missing thing, but if you put them together, this is the so-called unipotent radical of this thing. The name comes from some kind of classification or structure theory of the groups. But for the moment, just keep in mind that all these elements are actually unipotent elements. And this unipotent radical is not arbitrarily structured. In fact, because of the way we write on the matrix, this thing actually determines this thing by transpose. And this thing actually determines this thing. Sorry, not this thing. Ah. Mm -hmm. This thing. So essentially, you only have this and that as the essential element of this, of this part of the uniform radical. And there's also one more thing here in the middle. Uh, anyway, we will come back to here when we need more of this theory. But for now, let us focus on the Borel thing. And what I'm going to say is that uh, if you think about how all these things act on the coordinates, you see the following. This is some kind of abuse of language. The boundary component sort of state. So if you think about the modular curve case, I said that this uh, upper triangular matrix is preserved this infinity point, this 1 over 0. So now you might wonder what is being preserved here. And if you think about the abstract meaning of this parabolic, it's actually preserving those kind of elements which have the first R elements here and nothing else. So this is exactly the kind of thing that is going to be infinity. <laughs> so. So maybe as a kind of abuse of language, I would say, well, you have first r by r block being infinity. This is, of course, cheating. There's no such element in mathematics, but it's intuition. And then you have the remaining n by n, n by r block given by some genuine kind of coordinate, which is like a smaller z over space. And this is now what you can, the kind of coordinate you can see. And if you really don't like that, this actually just means uh, 0, 1, 1, zr. So if you don't like cheating, you can use the correct projected coordinates, and that's, that's what you need. Well, in fact, I probably shouldn't just say projected coordinate, because secretly I was already using some kind of Grassmannian coordinates there because these are really not just one column. There are several columns there anyway. Yeah, so basically, this is isomorphic to a smaller Zigo domain, I mean, Zigo half, half space. So each parabolic will correspond to each, some kind of copy of this. And the size is corresponding to the size of, I mean, the size of the, all, each of the elements in the parabolics. And what is the kind of h star we should put? So now I'm going to write down some Hn star. So this is going to be the Hn adjoining a lot of smaller spaces. So I actually need the sp2n orbits, not just one. And then uh, I will have firstly one size smaller, and then just keep going down. And I have now to introduce also the zero dimensional thing here. So when I write h0, it really just means one point. So you so have all kinds of smaller spaces there. And I didn't really emphasize, but they have dimensions you can easily calculate. This is dimension, this is dimension equal to this. And this thing has dimension well, it's only a matter of basic principle, and this one has dimension 0. So you can see that there is actually a gap of the dimension. This one has to drop a lot of dimension 
down to there when n is large. And this is one of the reasons that uh, the Bayer-Barrow complications are actually quite singular, because you are really squeezing a lot of things down to just some smaller dimensional thing. And this toroidal thing I mentioned, I, I guess it's kind of hopeless I, I can say anything about them today. <laughs> but I can just give you some hint. So they actually make use of some other structure rather than just this, this thing. Or if you look at that picture, this, this group, 13x on this smaller space. So in some sense, when we define the variable real complication, we are only keeping a very small part of the whole parabolic group. It's only sort of half of the Levy component. So all these, uh, so this part I didn't say, this is actually some kind of, this is GOR, and this is uh, SP two times N minus R. These two together form the so-called Levy component. Sorry? They don't act on it, so they are translations of this thing. Just like in the case of upper half plane, the whole SL2 doesn't act on the infinity, but it moves the infinity to other, other things on P1. Yeah. But as I said, these are really orbits. <laughs> yeah, if we act on it, then this will be subsumed into it. Yeah. Okay, coming back here. Uh, Fiber product, it's not really fiber product, it's, it has some. Yes. It's not fiber product, you have some, some stabilizer, yes. Anyway, I haven't finished what I want to say here, so there are more space here. So the Levy is uh, GOR times uh, SP2 minus R. Okay, and then we are only using this part. And sometimes people have notations for these kind of things. So this part is sometimes denoted GH. H means some so-called Hermitian part. So it's acting on a smaller Hermitian domain. And this part is this, uh, well, well, later we'll refine this thing. For now, I just denoted by GL tilde. So this is the Hermitian part. And it's only this Hermitian part which acts on this smaller kind of symmetry spaces on the boundary. And we are losing lots of information. For example, we lose the other part of the levy. We also lose the whole unipotent radical. And when we actually want to construct the so-called toroidal complication, we have to use those things again. Those things will actually be used. But now we are basically just forgetting them. That's why dimensions really drop a lot down to here. And this. Uh, well, when you write those things, you have to be careful. So I didn't really say how you glue them together. So there is actual terminology. This is with uh, Sataka topology. And you use the correct topology to put things together, and then you form the quotient. So in fact, I just write. Yeah, so this will give you the the better work amplification. So just by this description, you know that there are some kind of natural stratifications. The stratifications are given by the images of each of these, these kind of elements. So you will have a big open strata given by the original HN minus, I mean, quotient by gamma. This is like a big open strata, but now you have a lot of boundary strata. The boundary strata are locally closed, and they are given by the image of the, all these other smaller symmetry spaces. This is really a piece of language. When I say smaller version of this one, I just mean some orbits, I mean something in the orbits there. OK, so this is a picture for the sympathetic group. And you can imagine that we basically can do something very similar for other groups. So uh, I probably won't spend as much time on the other cases, but I will at least write down something for each of them. Uh, are there any questions for this, this picture? I guess it's good to keep in mind that Bayer Baroque conventions are quite simple minded in some sense because. As a set, you just put all the smaller Schumann varieties to the boundary. Of course, you have to be careful how you put them, and also you have to keep in mind that you really have orbits. You don't have just one for each. 
And there are some very special cases where things are really simple. So for example, if gamma is like sp2 and z, then you actually just have one copy each. So it looks really simple-minded. It's like a union with all the smaller z equal spaces. But that is a coincidence. And in general, if you have other, other kind of arithmetic subgroup of sp2 and q, you do have lots of other, other copies. So we already see four by four matrices. The next one will be five by five. <laughs> okay. And also, when I write this notation, this is really cheating because uh, when I write U P Q, I really need to make a choice. So now I have to be secretly using some rational structure. So I, I have to. You choose some kind of imaginary causal field, for example. And this PQ indicates the signature of that at infinity. So signature is really just something information at the Archimedean place. And there are actually many, many kinds of unitary groups, not just the ones defined by Hermitian parents over imaginary causal fields. Yeah, so I would just say in words. So in fact, in general, you can have, like for example, division algebras or even more general semi-simple algebras, which are like a central over some CM field, and you can have involution of the second kind, and then you can use that to define a generalization of the Hermitian pairings, and those will define more complicated versions of the unitary groups. When you go to the real number, all these things become down to something like products of this UPQ I have written down earlier, for some, some I mean, depending on how many places you have. But at the other places, at like these non Archimedean places, all your choices you have made can give you very different groups. So just keep in mind that we are very much simplifying the picture here. This is the simplest possible situation where you only use the major quadratic field and some nice Hermitian pairing. So if you remember, we, we use something like, uh, well, I told you that this, something like this would be nice. And there's a reason for that, because if I put the matrix this way, there are some obvious kinds of isotropic subspaces. So things like this. Well, now I have five. <laughs> so size r, size q minus r, p minus q. Not long enough. Size so r again, size q minus r again. This kind of space are, these are isotropic subspaces, and also rational. And the parabolics will be stabilized in this kind of subspace. And this is just the maximal parabolics. If you want all the other parabolics, you will consider flex instead of just that single subspace. So we have our parabolics, well, maximal parabolics. Are conjugate to uh, well, I have something like this, and there is a block here which basically is a smaller unitary group, and then something like this. These two are basically determined by each other. Uh, so these are uh, basically the same copy of GL. I didn't say which quadratic field I have there. Let me say, K. Okay. And this is like GLRK. I'm indicating the rational structure here. And all the other blocks here, these nine elements here, give you a smaller, well, this is an abuse of notation, but it's dropping the signature, the both numbers of signature. Well, it's dropping both of the numbers by R. And it's actually defined by this following pairing. It's 1 Q minus R, S minus 1 Q minus R. But this S is the set in the middle is the same, but you just shrink the size on the two ends. And then now you have all these 
unipotent radical. This uniform radical is actually not such a complicated group. In fact, uh, there's the entries, the, the, the things with only entries here form the center of this. And if you model the center, it becomes another vector group. So it's actually like a two-step vector group. So this is a unipotent radical here. OK, so this is the kind of parabolic which stabilizes those kind of subspace. And this now will give you the way to write down, uh, I guess you can guess the answer. Now you're just union all these uh, R going up to Q. And then you have the domains for, sorry. Uh, this is uh, U, P, Q, and then it's the orbits of of this. You just put them together, and then you get all these uh, smaller things you want. And this uh, minimal complication is basically just the quotient of this. So it's similar. It is also stratified by smaller spaces, which look like smaller unitary Schumann varieties. Well, it's not quite Schumann varieties, as I said. We are just talking about kinetic components. But the same picture is true if you now consider all the kinetic components together. The questions about like compactifications or other kind of local kind of geometric or global geometric questions can be treated sort the of component by component. So you really don't have to worry about the subtlety when you have more than one component there. And let me just mention in words. So here we are using some very nice kind of pairing of signature PQ over just an image quantity field. If you do use some kind of like semi-simple algebra or just for example division algebra of larger size, then the drop of the number here might be not really like 0, 1, 2, up to Q. You might have to drop a lot each time. And in fact, sometimes when you choose some kind of division algebra as a whole, you have nowhere to drop. <laughs> the whole thing is just compact. So it's possible that depending on how you choose your original structure that in this case, you might have nothing to put here. So, so this is something to keep in mind. So sometimes you have no rational isotropic subspace. There's just none because your, your algebra is too large. <laughs> yeah, so just keep this in mind. So when people talk about unitary Schumann variety, it's really unclear what they mean. <laughs> Please do ask them what exact, I mean, how exactly they define it because there are just too many unitary Schumann varieties. I think for each signature, you have been finding many of them. Well, in fact, the same is true for almost everything else. So let me go, go back to, but this is zero prime. <laughs> so what do I mean? So I mentioned this importance of rational structure. So for, uh, I'm a bit cheating now. So I didn't say what G is. GR equal to SO2R. It's not terribly clear what we really have, right? So if, if this is just two copies of SO2RQ, then it's very simple minded. You basically just get a product situation. So then you have, well, I don't have the right notation, but then. Uh, QQX on two copies of the familiar Poincaré upper half plane. And then, if you want to define the Babe or compactification of that product, it's also just a product of those things. So, this, if you want to put a star, is really just this star, this. But then you get the whole bunch of things, right? So, you have, in addition to the open strata, you have lots of other smaller ones. Well, there's a boundary of the first thing. So you have, oh, I should also include the G action.
And then you also have this. It's kind of stupid because you can you already imagine what I want to write, but I still <laughs> am busy with writing all of them. Okay, anyway, there are three kinds of boundary components in this case. But this is certainly not the usual situation we would really be interested in, although, of course, you can always take the product of two modular curves. But there's another very interesting case is when you have, for example, a totally real field F, then you can actually make the rational points act on this because you have your tensor F of the Q, sorry, F to R, then there are two embeddings from F into R. So if F is totally real, Projecting over Q, then you have two embeddings from F into R, so you can have SL2 F acting on this product. So this is the same symmetry space, but now you have a totally different rational structure. Well, this SL2F is certainly defined by, it's certainly some kind of classical group. It preserves the alternating pairing, but not over F. So what are the possible subspaces isotropic? There's actually only one possibility, because your coordinate has to be over F. So in this case, it might be confusing, but this is not that, because it depends on the, the rational structure you are talking about. When you, when you talk about rational boundary components, the rational structure matters. So this is. GQ equal to this F points. Well, this time you just have a, what is the right way to write it? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, anyway, I will just write this way. Uh, yeah. Is this right? Let me write. Uh, sorry, I, I, I will still be able to write infinity here. That's why I'm confused. This is infinity, sorry. Infinity. Well, it's not really wrong because the action preserves it, but I'm, this is what I really mean. I really just want infinity. Although the, the, what I wrote was literally still right, but yeah. OK, yeah, so, so what I really want to mean is just now there is an infinity here. But this is the F version of infinity. But there's only one rational boundary component now, only one. Only one kind. And what is the dimension? The dimension is two here. But these kind of things are zero dimensional. So when you consider the singularity of this thing, so this is now, uh, well, there are two copies. And then you take the minimum compactification. This is really, well, this is something we call the Hilbert modular surface. In fact, this is already mentioned yesterday. But the cusps are zero dimensional points. So you really have some normal thing with some points given there. But you are starting kind of squeezing some two dimensional thing into that point there. So well, it's a normal thing, but you have some kind of zero dimensional thing there from two dimensional down there. So I guess the picture looks a bit like this. Imagine this is a typical example of something normal, but not regular. So normal things can be pretty singular, in fact, even in dimension two. This kind of cone is, is normal, but it's not, not regular, not smooth, not smooth. We are working over some nice space, so there's no difference between these two notions. Yeah, so I think historically, for some, here's a book defined some kind of nice resolution of singularity for this thing, and that's one of the earliest examples of toroidal compactifications. So if you blow up each of these cusps, which is zero dimensional, into some kind of curve, then it becomes more smooth. Yeah, and if you just, just have this zero, two dimensional thing squeezing down to zero dimensional, then you have something which is Normal, but still quite singular.
Wow. <laughs> well, I'll be much more concise in the remaining examples. So I will not really emphasize all the rational structures anymore. I, you just imagine we have made some good choices of rational cho groups. Uh, the principle will be for the simplicity, we will always choose things to be as split as possible, <laughs> namely as simple as possible so that you have as many rational parabolic as possible. But even so, for example, in this case, what's the notation yesterday? It was something like SO to n star. So what could possibly be the boundary components? Well, we union something like this. So we still have the orbits, and then we have all these spaces. And now the interesting thing is that you have to drop by four. It's kind of, sorry, I, I should write SO star here. Ah, there's actually another star. And uh, R only goes to about half of the size of N. And this is not so surprising because if you remember, I said that when N is even, you can use this Hamiltonian to define them. Now you need things which are rational, so spaces which have the actual Hamiltonian. That kills the freedom down to just half of them because Hamiltonians are kind of larger. <laughs> ah, yes. Without a star, it's really uninteresting. <laughs> Yeah. Hmm? Ah, yes, sure. Otherwise, I can just remove the first term, yes. I guess if I put r equals 0, it's still correct because it's a union, so. <laughs> it's redundant, but still correct. How about dimensions? Uh, the dimension is uh, a minus 1. You know the dimension is there, too. So it also drops a lot. So these three examples so far, well, in fact, not three, but three plus something. These are the all in the so-called pale type situation where you really have nice uh, modular interpretations. But as I said, there are some other cases where you also have more complicated but still feasible modular interpretations like this uh, house type or abelian type situation. And you might wonder whether things become much more complicated there. Fortunately not. In fact, those groups are not very split. <laughs> so you don't have much room to fit in lots of boundary components. So if you have, have like SOP2, this time the star is here. Uh, you have the original thing, and there are only two kinds of them. And both of them are actually not so bad. One is like a zero dimensional thing. It doesn't matter which one it is, it's zero dimensional. It, this is actually just some kind of modular curve kind of thing. So you don't really see big surprise on the boundary of this orthogonal type thing. I mean, the remaining orthogonal type things. Uh, to be fair, I should have written down all these parabolics for you, but I guess <laughs> maybe not today. If you are really interested, I can show you after the talk. Well, what else? Ah, there's this uh, something fun, but maybe it's not. <laughs> It's even farther from something we can describe explicitly. But again, as I said, all these remaining things like uh, orthogonal things or even exceptional things are not so bad just because they are not too large. Uh, <laughs> so I will just tell you the answer. The E7 case is actually, you can easily see this is only for fun because, well, you have three kinds. This is a rank three situation. In the bottom, you also have just one and zero. There is this one, which is, uh, is that so? maybe only the plus component. I'm not totally sure. Yeah. So the dimension here is 27. This one, you learned this in the first talk today, dimension 10. So we're really dropping a lot of dimension down from 27 to 10. And this is one. This dimension zero. Well, if you're curious, I can also write down E6. Uh, I 
didn't even mention what this is. So in any case, you have two cases here. Well, assuming you are taking the most split boundary, this is again zero dimensional here. Uh, sorry, not uh, was it zero dimensional? As I said, I was not very confident with E6. <laughs> Ah uh, yes, and then the other is the unitary five one. So this is dimension five. This is dimension sixteen. This is also dropping a lot. Anyway, you see all important examples. I probably forgot to say it. So yesterday we actually exhausted all real simple Hermitian symmetry spaces. All of them are there. So whether you learn abstract theory or not, you already see everything. And today, uh, the, the hidden thing is that when you look at all these questions, there's this uh, issue of rationality. So although these are simple-minded examples, but in general, just like the case of this uh, Gilbert modular surface, you have to imagine that several copies of the real symmetry space might have to be grouped together and have a combined action of some rational group. And that's sometimes the subtlety. But on the other hand, the spaces are just like this, and also the boundary components are just like that. The question is how they are grouped together to form the correct rational boundary component of the correct Rational group. Yeah. You mean in all these examples? I think so, just because uh, we, in, in all these examples, we actually know how to write down some group. Yeah. So it's cheating because you, if you write down the group, you know you get it. Yeah, but if you are asking whether there's an abstract reason that's so true. Which rational yeah. form you were in. Yeah, so. I didn't have time yesterday, but if I spend 15 minutes, I can define a rational form of E7 for you. That will act on this and has rank 3. There is a way, yes, using Octonians. <laughs> OK, so I guess we are really tired of all of these examples. <laughs> Given that I don't only have five minutes left, maybe I, instead of talking more about the Toledo convocation, which is an even more daunting task, <laughs> maybe let me just say a little bit what what I want to do after this, because all of these are complex coordinates. And we are not really just using these complex coordinates to do anything when you do number theory. So in practice, all these examples are good just because if you want to check some answer, you want some consistency check. Having the complex coordinates allow you to just write down something coordinate, like coordinates and at least check that the dimension is right. You shouldn't, you shouldn't be too surprised that a lot of you don't even know the correct dimensions to guess on. On the other hand, if you have these complex coordinates, they will always indicate the correct thing at least in the beginning. But how do we actually work on these things? We actually don't really use these coordinates because, for example, we don't have anything which is as good as these symmetry spaces over the integers. We don't have symmetry spaces over characters p. So in fact, uh, almost everything we know how to do depends on the model of abelian varieties in one way or another. So in the Zigo case, we, of course, already have a model of abelian varieties in the complex, over the complex numbers. Now you just write down the similar model of abelian varieties, but over more general basis. In fact, you can even talk about so-called abelian schemes, which are families of abelian varieties very smoothly over any kind of base ring. When you have something over any kind of base ring, it means that you can actually have some kind of so-called moduli over the integers. So that's actually what people talk about when you do so-called integral models. So integral models actually is sort of reinvented, and they coincide with the complex model when you take the complex points. I don't really think there's a better explanation. We're just so lucky. The moduli of abelian schemes give you the Zigo variety. And we're also very lucky that a lot of the things we wrote on the board, apart from these last two, can be embedded into the Zigo model variety, one way or another. So I mentioned this PL type case. This, rich, this are unitary Shimmer varieties, and also this SO star kind of thing there can be described using some moduli of RBM variety with so-called PEL structure. P means polarization, E means endomorphism structure by some semi-simple algebra with some positive involution, and there's a level structure. If you put the correct things together, well, I didn't tell you how, but there's a well-known way to create a modular problems also over the integers. So as I probably mentioned before, the principle is that to define a modular problem, you have to write down lots of defining equations or defining kind of conditions. As long as those conditions make sense over some ring, you will have a modular problem there. Then the job is to show it is representable. It's not trivial, but it's kind of well-known. And people know how to do that for PL-type varieties. 
So again, we have integral models for all of them, basically by playing with modal problems. And it's a great coincidence that when you take complex points, they again coincide with all these things, up to some uh, well-controlled failure. Uh, for this, uh, this kind of thing, as I mentioned, there are the house type or abelian type things. You need something more complicated than the PEL model problem. So people actually need to work harder. But still, there are some methods in house theory which will allow you to do something as well. So the only thing we really don't know how to do are these kind of things. Exceptional Schmal varieties. We just don't know. We don't even know how to write down a model over the complex numbers which correspond to these things. Yeah, so for them, well, there are, you feel that there are only two of them, but still, we don't know anything about them. But for all the other things, uh, we don't really use the complex coordinates to do anything over integers. That's just not possible. As I mentioned, after we form the quotient by gamma, the coordinates become something like a modular function or modular form. They are quite transcendental compared with the original coordinates. So there's really no hope to use the original knowledge to do something directly. On the other hand, because the great coincidence is in algebraic geometry, you can play with the modular of Alban varieties. And very luckily, at the local level, a lot of things still look like linear algebra and behave like symmetric spaces. So there's a so-called theory of local models which allow you to actually study the modular problems when the data is not too bad. So when you work over the integers, there are a lot of other issues like ramification and so on. They will naturally lead the things to be more complicated just because your group also gets more complicated when you take their integer points or their models over ZP and so on. Anyway, I guess those are really far from what we can say from here. But if you want to learn more about these things, uh, there are several things you can think about. One is that, well, I ignore all these theories about complex coordinates and canonical models. If you're interested, you know, you should still read the link and Milner and other people. They are wonderfully written, so it's interesting. And you, well, maybe not directly useful because, as I said, when you study number theory, you probably need another kind of knowledge, which is the knowledge of modular problems. That's a totally different know-how, but there's also a different source of things you can learn there. Unfortunately, things are more scattered. You really have to dig into the literature, catch your advisor when he's still there, and you know, they might flee away. But anyway, they are, not, they are good sources of knowledge, and you shouldn't let them go. Okay, so I will stop here. Thank you.